Yo, 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 what is up? Higher Learning is on. It is I, Van Lathan. And it's me, Rachel Lindsay. No pleasantries. None. Got no pleasantries for you guys. Normally, we, me and Rachel do between 10 and 15 minutes a very, very lighthearted banter, but I'm not feeling very lighthearted anything right now. Okay. Uh, so we were yet again assaulted with two incidents of police misconduct this past weekend. The first one happened uh, around Friday when video from a traffic stop in Virginia was released to the public. This, in, this video involved the Lieutenant uh, Caron Nazario He's an uh, Afro-Latin brother who was driving his car, was pulled over by police, was pepper sprayed, um, and in my opinion, unlawfully detained and roughed up by the cops. For sure. Okay. Um, I'm sure most people have seen the video now. He is suing the police department there in Virginia. And there's been an investigation opened by the Virginia State Police into the matter. One of the officers has already been fired. If you haven't seen the video, then what happens in the video is uh, Nazario's car is there. The cops roll up. This is a felony stop. They have their guns drawn. Uh, why it was a felony stop, we would later find out that they thought that it was a high-risk car stop because he was driving slow and his windows were really tinted. He did not have plates on the back of his car because it was new, but he did have dealer plates on it that are visible. So. Why they decided to draw weapons on this guy, I don't fucking know. Hmm. They draw their weapons. They go over and they talk to him. Well, he, they, they ask him to put his hands out. He refuses to get out of his car. Why? Because I don't know. Maybe he thought that he was going to be in front of a fucking firing squad. Right. Pure so, fear. So maybe he was scared to get out of his car because exactly. the cops have their guns drawn. Maybe it was that's at night, too. It was at night. He actually drove at a low speed to a well-lit area for his safety and for theirs. Mm -hmm. But they ignored that, right? And so then after that, they uh, they go over to the guy when his hands are out. He's asking why he was stopped. They don't tell him why he was stopped. They pepper spray him. First of all, they order him out of the car. He says, I'm afraid to get out of the car. One of the officers said, you should be afraid. So like, I'm going to get out of the car after that. Uh, they then pepper spray him. Um, and and they they drag him out of his vehicle. Uh, it turned out there was no charge filed, and now people are up in arms. Before we even get to the other tragedy, what did you think when you first saw that video, Rachel? Well, I mean, it's just, I felt helpless. It's like, what are we supposed to do? This is a man who is abiding by the law. He's doing everything that he's supposed to do. He pulls over. He complies. There wasn't even a reason to stop him. Then he expresses to the officer, just so you know, I'm, I'm scared. You know, he's, he's doing exactly what you're told to do, and it's still not enough. Yeah. Still not enough. That's, that's all I kept thinking over and over in my head. What are we supposed to do then? When you do everything right, it's still not enough. And just like, I, I don't just the, the the audacity of that officer to just say you should be you should be scared. I mean, just talking to civilians as if they're nothing. The people, the very people you're supposed to protect, you're talking to them as if they're like a bug. Okay. Just, so I'm gonna read it. I'm gonna read a, a back and forth text message situation here. Okay. Uh, okay. With a lawyer friend of mine mm -hmm. who saw my post and then he wrote this. Mm -hmm. Only because you asked this question in your post. Assuming the traffic stop was legit, ha, Lieutenant Nazario was not in his constitutional right to refuse to get out of the car. The Supreme Court has held, has held over and over again that the police can order a person out of the car until a traffic stop is over, and the refusal to do so is grounds for arrest. That doesn't mean other aspects of the stop were proper. They weren't. Or that they shouldn't be kicked off the force. They should. But the order was legal. Okay, so... That is in, result, in, in, in reaction to the fact that he was given an order to get out of his car and he did not get out. The conversation went further. This is between me and my lawyer friend who studied constitutional law. I asked, what does assuming the traffic stop was legit mean? Exactly. If the traffic stop wasn't legit, then does he have to get out or not? The order would then be fruit of a poisonous tree and unlawful. 
But all a cop had to do is, all a cop has to do is lie. Say he was swerving, he didn't come to a full stop, he didn't signal. And it's almost impossible to show an unlawful stop. I then say, well, this was a felony stop. A stop. This was a high-risk felony stop, right? Felony mm-hmm. stop is when, hey, uh, you know, a cop lights you up, right? And he pulls you over. He says, hey, how you doing? He walks over to your situation, and he goes, hey, uh, you're speeding. License registration, cool. You give him your license registration, whatever, okay? Uh, that's not what this is. This is one of those ones you see on TV. Hey, get out of the car. Guns drawn. High-risk stop. Normally a felony suspect or like a dangerous situation, right? So normally in a situation like that, and this is Van speaking from what he, from the lay of this that from, as a layman, should I say, normally in a situation like that, they know why they're stopping you. So either you just ran from the cops and they feel like, okay, what is this person going to do to get away from this? Or they're executing some kind of high risk situation. You're a violent criminal. You're in a stolen car. You got all kinds of dope on you. Uh, well, they they got a description that someone inside the car is kidnapped, and now they have to. Normally, that's when they bring out the 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 the, the gats and stuff like that. But in a situation like that, more oftentimes than not, they know what they're suspecting you of. So it's warranted at least some of the time in them reacting the way that they're reacting. Okay, so I asked him. I said, "This was a felony stop, so that seems pretty cut and dry." He goes, ah, do we know what the claimed justification for the stop was? Okay, now we know. The justification for the stop seems to be that he didn't have dealer plates on his car. So, he didn't have plates on his car. And then he drove at a low speed. The stop was because he didn't have plates. And he drove at a low speed. It was at night. And it took him a while to pull over, which we now know why. But that's what the police were trying to say. Well, it took him a long time to pull All over. All within your rights. I looked mm-hmm. it up. Mm-hmm. If you are getting stopped by the police, you have the right, the right. to drive to a safe, yes, spa- safe that space. Is true. And 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 then execute your business with the cops. That you is have true. that right to do that. Okay? Cool. So now we know. So now we can get rid of everything that me and this guy were talking about because the stop wasn't lawful. It wasn't a lawful stop. It wasn't. So it was all bullshit. So any of the straw men that anyone wants to make, that anybody wants to make, in order to protect the American status quo in the situation of this guy is out the window. We didn't get a chance to catch our breaths, our our, our collective breath. Because as we were catching our collective breath, Dante Wright was killed in Minnesota. The situation where a 20-year-old man was pulled over by the police officers. I think they say he was pulled over because he had something... He had hang- expired plates. He had expired plates. Okay, so he had expired plates. Um, Which, mind you, is common right now in COVID because so many people have either had issues getting to the DMV, getting plates, because it's so hard to get into. It's actually quite common right now for people to have expired plates. They, they, uh, they pulled this young, young man over he had his fire plates. They ran him. He had a warrant. The warrant, as I understand it, was for a misdemeanor charge. Okay? He had a warrant. Uh, they tell him he has a warrant. They start uh, cuffing him. They're going to take him to jail. He slips out of the cuffs, uh, jerks his arm, tries to get into the car, and I guess evade the police. Uh, the officer, a senior officer, pulls out uh, what she thinks, she claims she thinks, is her taser. It's actually her weapon. And she shoots him. He drives for a couple of blocks. Dante Wright is dead. Okay. I watched this video. First of all, mm-hmm. Rachel, did you watch the video? I did watch the video. What were your thoughts when you watched the video? I watched it in real time. I watched it the first time they showed it when the chief of police said, I'm going to show the video to the press. I, I just happened to catch it right then and there. I couldn't believe it. But I... I I guess what I couldn't believe in, in that I was seeing as she was yelling, taser, taser, she pulls out her gun, she shoots one shot, and then she says, oh my gosh, I shot him. And you actually see from the cam another officer, a black male officer, who looks shocked. Like they almost can't, they're stunned, they're standing there, they're stunned. It's like they can't believe what's happening. And then I see the, I hear the police chief say, it was an accidental, we believe it was an accidental shooting. And I think that phrase has, 
continue to ring over and over and over again in my ears because I'm, I'm hearing you talk about a senior officer. I'm hearing you say it was an accidental shooting and I'm not under, I'm not connecting the dots here. How does a very senior officer make that type of mistake? I'm not understanding it. It was so hard to watch. I'm telling you, Van, I like, e- even as we were preparing for this podcast, we were going to talk about one issue. I did not think that we were going to have to end up talking about this and having seen the video at the same time. I like, I, I, I don't know. Go ahead. You can talk. I understand. I understand. I get it. Uh, I watched the video. From the time that he tries to wriggle free and is trying to get in his car to get away, um, there's about six or seven seconds that she has in her hand what is her firearm uh, and not a taser. Correct. So, and if you watch the video, it seems like an eternity. Now, in my estimation, if we're talking about a bunch of people who don't have the wherewithal to do their jobs, then we need to talk about taking those jobs apart. Because we need to keep people safe. Forget about all the emotion that's going to come from what it is that we're talking about. The question is, very simple. How do we keep black people safe from getting killed by the cops? Like, how do we do that? I don't know. She's mistrained. The other guys are scared. There's always an excuse as to why someone either gets pepper sprayed or chalked out. That's it. There's always an excuse. Uh, Why were so many police officers at the scene? That's another thing I couldn't understand. If this was a routine traffic stop, why were there multiple police officers there? Why were you calling for backup? I don't understand the situation. Like, you obviously were scared. You felt threatened in some kind of way. And to me, there seemed to be no need for that. Expired plates? Misdemeanor? Why was that the situation? Why were you already coming into the situation that hot? That's part of the problem. Right. Like, coming to be the marauding force of whatever it is. And it seems like all of this stuff is some sort of perverse reaction to anyone challenging a police officer's authority. It's like I what I the in in the case of Lieutenant Nazario, that cop who is who's now fired, his name is Joe Gutierrez, he was so incensed, so incensed, he lost himself. So incensed, and nothing saved Lieutenant Nazario from that that fear and humiliation. Not the fact that he was dressed fully in his fatigues, or that he is an army officer in the medical corps. As a matter of fact, Gutierrez deranked him. Gutierrez looked at him and said, what are you, a specialist or a corporal? He goes, no, I'm a lieutenant. I'm a lieutenant. I'm an officer in this country's armed forces. Know what's going on? A lot of people out there making a lot of excuses. Hey, don't run from the cops. Hey, just comply. Hey, whatever. Hey, don't fucking kill us. Hey, you're trained officers. You don't get a get out of jail free card every time. Oh, you know what? That's not true. Yes, you do. You do get one. Yeah, you do. Um, here's the deal. When the, the video of Lieutenant uh, Nazario came out, I went on Twitter and I asked for police officers to come on the podcast today uh, so we could talk about this issue. This was before what happened with Dante Wright. I wanted to call it off. I think we both feel very emotional about this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we asked, and people responded. So we're here on the podcast, going to be about our work. We have two detectives coming on uh, from the Baltimore City Police Department. They are Ralph Horton and Dre Severino. They have a podcast called The Silverback Chronicles. 
we are going to take a break. And when we come back, we are going to try to talk out the festering, decrepit, decaying wound that is American policing with two members of the American police force. This interview is actually taking place um, because after the events of this weekend, specifically the first event with uh, Coron Nazario in Virginia being pulled over, I decided that I wanted to talk, that Rachel and I would be good for us to talk to some police officers to try to figure out what's going on with policing in America. Like, incidents like this happen all the time, and we talk, to, we talk amongst ourselves, but it seems like we're caught up in this never-ending cycle. And so I wanted to talk to cops about this. And uh, unfortunately, while I put out that request, uh, another, dare I say, well, definitely more serious incident happened in Minnesota where 20-year-old Dante Wright was killed by a police officer who um, apparently they're saying she thought she was going for her taser. She went for her weapon. She shot him once. He died. So, um, two gentlemen responded to me. Uh, a lot of cops did, but I, I checked out some of these guys and stuff, and I thought it was pretty interesting. They had an interesting perspective. Detectives Ralph Horton and Dre Severino. Am I yes, getting sir. that right? The Yes, sir. Detective Dre Severino. Detective Dre Severino of the Baltimore Police Department. They're also hosts of a podcast called The Silverback Chronicles. Um, but watched a little bit of the podcast in this podcast. Rachel, did you watch any of it? I saw a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. A little bit of it. Uh, where you guys said that not all cops are bad cops. And you wanted to do the podcast to be able to prove that to people. It's, to be honest with you guys, becoming increasingly more difficult to believe that. So I guess what I'll ask you guys right now before we even get into the nuts and bolts of this is what is a good cop at this point? Well, I'll start off first. You're looking at him. I'll tell you why. Because we were born and raised in New York City, Long Island. We know what it is to grow up with police officers. We know what it is to get out and do community policing. See what I'm saying? We never wanted to be treated a specific way. So when we police, we treat everyone with the utmost respect. Mm. I mean, that's the biggest thing. You know, the biggest thing nowadays is community policing. We've been doing that since we got on the job. You know, there's nothing like getting out of your patrol car, going to speak to a business owner or going to a hot block and talking to the guys on the block just so they can get familiar with who you are. And it's all about respect. I mean, it's a rat race. They know what we're here for. You know, and it's, 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 it's not nothing crazy what we're doing, but you build that respect by getting out of your car, speaking to them like a man. Hey, how you doing? My name is Officer Horton. Yeah, I just got on the job. I've been here for, you know, once they see, they, once they see your mannerisms and they see your dialect, they know, they know you're not from that area. So how do you, you know, how, how do you, how do you break that down? By being real with them. Yeah, I'm from New York. I have fun. What do you like to do? So I, I no doubt believe what you two are saying about yourselves. But then I think where, where what Van and I struggle with and what a lot of people struggle with is you're a part of this bigger system. And it, as Van said in his introduction, it seems to be this never ending cycle where you're afraid to look at the news or a notification because it seems like it doesn't stop happening. So for us as black people, as citizens in this country, how do we continue to have faith in the system that you're a part of, the system as a whole? Well, you know, unfortunately, that's, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's individuals that make the badge look bad. It's not the whole department. And with these two incidents that happened, you know, one person lost his life yesterday afternoon. That's horrible. That's horrific. May he rest in peace. Absolutely. God bless his soul. Condolences to his family. But more, you know, at the root of it all, that's training. That's training within that department. Those officers didn't have, they weren't trained to go out there and handle that situation the way it should have been handled, accordingly. And that's the sad part of policing. Like, like for example, um, when we have, we have our tasers on one side and we have our hand weapon on the other side so that that, that confusion doesn't happen. 
I mean, every 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 department has their policies and procedures. You know, right. and I'm speaking as Ralph Horton. I'm speaking as a technical for him, even though I do it as a profession. Now, I don't know what their policies and procedures are, but I know policing and getting out, just like the incidents that happened in um, what was in Virginia with the uh, with the uh, the uh, the second lieutenant. That situation was disgusting, and when we read the report online, it's it's insane how he could he could justify that calling it a high risk car stop. I taught in the academy. That's not a high risk car stop at all. Even when he wrote it, when he wrote it in his report that they were driving slow, so I consider that a high risk car. That's not a high risk car stop. So check it. Even if even if he said it's a high risk car stop, right? He put in there he's uh, 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 the officer put he uh, that the uh, the individual was eluding police. Okay, cool. You conducted a car stop, right? What did your investigation lead you to? What you got? What you got on scene and started talking to that individual? Where's the threat? Why, why is there a need for pepper spray? For what? The man has his hands out of the window and he's complying with me. At the end of the day, you still, you still haven't addressed yourself as an officer. You still didn't completely conduct the car stop by saying, sir, how you doing? My name is so-and-so. I'm from this police department. The reason for the stop is none of that was conducted. So therefore, they was doing their own thing. Not even the vibe by the policies and procedures set forth for them in that department. Right. So, so they need to go. Right. So this is my thing. And I'm gonna be transparent with you guys. You guys said on 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 YouTube, excuse me, you guys said on Twitter that I had to be ready for the real when we we're gonna have this conversation. And you Let's guys are giving off real energy. So I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't think there are any good cops. Okay. And I'll tell you why. The reason why I don't think there are any good cops is because we're talking about several different instances here of situations to where training seemed to be either insufficient. OK, or that the training wasn't followed. And that doesn't even get me started on another situation that's happening in Minnesota where Derek Chauvin put his knee on the back of George Floyd's neck for over nine minutes and George Floyd died later on for us to find out that he's not supposed to be doing that. OK, so apparently the training doesn't matter because we're looking at different parts on the map. We're talking about Virginia. We can go back as far as Eric Garner. We can talk about anywhere where these things happen and cops are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. That to goes me, back to, to me. Okay, I'm sorry. To, to, to me, the thing that keeps citizens safe against police who are armed, right, is standards. And it seems to me that the cops in situations like this aren't adhering to those standards. So explain to me What's not happening then? Like, what's not working? Because a lot of these things, you said before that it's unfortunate. It's not unfortunate. It's tragic. He's dead. So, and, and that's because somebody is mistrained. To me, it seems like policing is something that needs to be taken apart in America. Am I wrong? That, that um, I wouldn't even say it's mistraining. That comes down to the individual at that moment. Because the training has kept him and I safe and everyone that comes across in this violent, really violent city of Baltimore City, where we can go to any hood, we can go to any neighborhood and be fine. Why? Because we treat people with respect. Now there's certain circumstances where things get a little hectic, right? If you listen to our podcast, we were the first ones to say what happened with, um, please give me his name. What? I'm sorry, with, with Mr. Floyd being rest in peace, that was absolutely wrong. We we never treated anyone in that manner. So I will say it comes down to the individual who's not trusting his training. And huh. you know, it, it's and it's a sad part because people get used to policing their way instead of what they adhere to, what they signed into to do, and be followed out every day, all day. And those and, and, and those are the stigmas. Those are the rotten apples of the departments. Like, there's individuals that made those individual choices. How many rotten apples does it take for the whole tree to be rotten? I agree with you. I agree a thousand percent with you. But there's more great officers out there than bad ones. And, and that, there, there's so much violence that goes on day in and day out that you don't even hear. So right. what's we, in place, though, for... I guess I, I, we hear you. And I do, I do believe that there are good cops. But my Absolutely. thing is, is 
But my thing is, is when when you see bad behavior or you see a pattern from a particular officer, what's in place to make another officer who is a good a good cop feel like they can put tell on that cop or, or or report that cop for what they're doing because I feel like that's what's not happening. I'm sure you see people on the force right now who you know are not doing things the way that they're supposed to. So where do the good cops fall in holding those cops accountable to avoid the tragic incident that happened today and what has continued to happen in this country? I agree with you and I'm with you 100%. A lot of them don't have the testicular fortitude to say no. Like that instance that happened in Virginia, the other, the secondary officer knew he was wrong. told that. I'm sorry? The other younger cop knew he was wrong. That's what I'm telling you. He should have told, he should have pulled his partner and be like, yo, what the hell are you doing? What are you doing? If you see a guy that's in service and he's complying, he has his hands out the window and he's talking to you, where's the threat level? And, and he wasn't right. talking to you in a high pitched voice. He's talking to you calm and you're still raising the situation with, from, from a five to a 10. There's no need for that. There's no need for that at all. That's disgusting. That's, that's not what we signed up for. That's not why we do the job. And that's why our podcast was great. Because we are bridging the gap. And I agree with you. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of officers out there just putting a bad stain on, on his badge. Because people forget, even those officers forget, it's a privilege to do what we do. We put our lives on the line every day. Every day, all day. I take pride in that shit. So when I see a dirty officer, I'm gonna slap his ass up and I'm gonna send him and I'm gonna send him so he can get so he can get jammed up. We, there's no need for that. We tell him you can't work with us because we're not we're not doing that. There's been instances that we pull people. You know, sometimes you get in the heat in the battle, whatever may happen, you get a gun, somebody may point a gun at you. And once the cuffs are on, the fight is over. It's over. But you know, we're human and you're still like emotionally like, wow, this guy almost killed me. But you have to rely on your partners to say, hey, 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 stop. It's over. It's done. We're good. Everybody's good. All lives are saved. It's a gun arrest. He's going to go to jail. You right. You got paperwork. See what I'm saying? And that's what we're trying to, to do always... You got, do you guys believe that there is systemic racism inside of policing? Baltimore there's racism, is... there's racism everywhere in this country. Okay. So I'm talking, all, I, I'm talking specifically about as it relates to policing right now. Baltimore obviously had a situation with Freddie Gray uh, some time ago. The reason why I'm talking, I'm telling you guys about this is because we're, we're dealing with two situations right here that involve car stops. All right. Black men are significantly more uh, likely to be stopped by the police in America than are white men. Um, of their same age. Black men at uh, 25 years of age are significantly more likely to be stopped by police officers than white men of their same age and less likely to... Contraband is less likely to be found on black men being stopped in that same, during that, uh, of that age than it is uh, of their white counterparts. So it seems to me that no matter where you go, there is a real problem in policing with over-policing black people. We have two car stops that we're talking about right now. Both of them not serious at all. One of them ends in a death. The other one ends in the degradation and macing, pepper spraying of a man. Or is there something in policing that is unfairly targeted towards black people? Hell no. no. Hell no. Let me tell you something. So you're saying, you're telling me right now that of every with everything that we're seeing, because you don't think in any way that black people are unfairly targeted by the police. It's documented. It's a fact that 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 no. that, that, that that is true. And that, that that's a fact. I'll give you that. But well, he just said no, you just said yes. It's it's documented that that is true. More blacks are stopped. But from my perspective, I don't see it that way. Not not what we deal with. I can't talk about every jurisdiction and what they go through. I can talk about what I go through and what we see in one of the worst cities in America. So in my in my perspective, to say to answer your question, it's a numbers game, right? Here in Baltimore, predominantly the, the city is 90% black. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have more black people stop. But let's talk about middle America, right? Where is a white officer stopping a white uh driver? That never makes the papers because it's not sexy. You see what I'm saying? What it's do you mean by that? Sexy. I'm sorry? It, when, you, when you say a white officer stopping a white person, for what, why, right. when, where, how? 
Right. I mean, it happens all across the country, right? But when it may, when it happens in major cities, he's just saying it's not that's, heavy. Late, it's that's not the heavy clickbait. Document. That's the clickbait. See what I'm saying? Because it happens all across this country. Where in Wyoming, there might be somebody being stopped, and it's predominantly white. White officers stopping a white person. It just doesn't make the national news because it's not that sexy. Uh, uh, hey, hey, Van, I'll give I'll give you another I'll give you another situation, Rachel, as well. An officer from New Mexico just got killed. He conducted a car stop, did everything right. Besides, besides stick to his training. He told an individual, can you please um, give me the AR rifle that, you, that I see next to you? Can you get out of the car and give it to me? And when he got out of the car, do you think he gave it to him? He gave it to him. He shot him up. And the officer died right there on the scene. Now, 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 if he, if he was better trained, he would, he, would not, he would not advise that individual to get out of his vehicle and hand him over an AR, an AR rifle. Now, that's the training for, and unfortunately, it cost him his life. Now, that just happened. I don't see nobody talking about that. And that happened in New Mexico. So what I'm saying is, when, when I relate it back to these issues, it's individuals making their own personal choice. That's not the department at all. Can, can I can I answer the reason why that might not be be racial? First of all, I don't. No, go ahead. No, answer. answer the question. Can, go can ahead. I yeah, answer the talk. reason why that might like not it. be being talked about? Um, so here's the thing, and I don't mean to be crass when I say this. Police officers have a very dangerous job. Anytime any life is lost anywhere, it is a tragedy. Police officers walk around society with guns. They're trained, supposedly in de-escalation. They're trained, supposedly, in crisis situations. They're trained to handle these things. People who are on their way home, coming from the grocery store, going to pick up their kids, they're not. So when you see them die in situations, criminals kill police officers. Police officers kill citizens, both criminals and not criminals. If somebody pulls out an AR-15 and shoots up a cop, what is the headline supposed to be? The cop didn't follow his training. He got killed by a criminal who wanted to kill a police officer. But if a father or a mother or a son gets into an, uh, uh, an incident with someone who is supposed to be specifically trained in how to handle that incident and they end up dead, well, then obviously people are going to ask questions about how far and how well American p- policing goes and works. And I'm going to be real with you. I haven't heard any answers to any of these questions. Not from you guys and not from the people that we talk to every single time we have this conversation. We're talking about the fact that officers aren't trained well. Well, what we got to do to train them well? Well, that's the thing. I said they are trained, but at the end of the day, it, it, goes, it boils down to them being an individual and making an individual decision as towards being an agent of your of your department and acting accordingly to the law set forth in that department. I can't ma- I can't tell you why he did what he did. I can only tell you it was it, it, they need better training. As as for the gentleman, the twenty year old that passed away yesterday, I saw the video on that. It was disgusting. It was disgusting. And the thing was, he complied. He got out of his car and he had his hands and he had his hands behind his back. The officer failed to put the cuffs on him correctly. And then when his partner came, that's when the end tried to show, go inside the vehicle and pull off. He didn't bring him to the back of the car. Either. What he should, what the officers should have done, they should have pulled him out of the patrol car, out of his out of his personal car, like he did, instead of cuffing him right there at the front door. He should have took him to the back of the back of the back of the car, searched him, cuffed him. That's it. But no harm, no foul. There's but no like, need for all that extra stuff. Shoulda, woulda, couldas aren't helping what's happening right now in our country. And I think that's what's so frustrating and where Van is coming from, too. I hear y'all, I keep, y'all keep saying it's an individual and you keep saying they don't have enough training. But obviously saying those things isn't fixing the problem. And so we're at a place right now where we're tired of being told, you know, like, calm down and trust the system. We're tired of being told, hey, that's just an, that's a, that's a rotten apple. We're tired of being told they weren't trained properly because none of that is saving lives. People are still out here dying unnecessarily. So my question to you is, you both, is then what can be done? Because 
just blaming it on a, blaming it on training or blaming it on a certain individual isn't fixing the problem. It's a it's a systematic problem, right? That's you know, like that's why we say it's systemic. That's that's that is how that is. It, it, you have to admit that because it's continuing to happen within this system. So, in your opinion, what should be what should happen to hold these officers accountable when they lack proper training or when they're they're a rotten individual within the system? Because it's got to be more than just suspension, than just firing, and then they can go to another, uh, join somebody else's force, which is why we're right now fighting this whole qualified immunity thing. I really would love your opinion on whether or not you agree there should be a qualified immunity, what should happen to an officer when they do do something like this, when they're rotten, when they don't do the proper training, especially with Dante Wright, who it was a senior quote, a very senior officer who pulled a trigger and shot him instead of pulling the taser. So he, he, you can speak on the qualified, right? But I just want to add this into the mix, right? We're dealing with individuals, right? Now, Van, let me ask you a quick question. What what terrifies you? Are you scared of snakes? Like, what Am terrifies you? I'm scared you? of snakes. Uh, I'm scared of cops. That's what terrifies okay, me. Okay, cool. All right. And, and, and ma'am, what, what, what scares you? Uh, I'm going to agree with Van. The police. Okay, fine. So here you have each individual. I get you go with cops. You never, everyone has a different threat assessment. And a lot of people are not put into a position. I believe Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face, right? There's certain people that are put into certain situations that they don't know how they're going to react until it happens. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? That's are you talking about something. the police? Because the police are talking, trained I'm, for these situations. No, no, no. I'm talking on a human level. On a human level, whether we're police officers or... Don't accept it. And I, and I, accept and I, and I, and, and, and I, 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 my man, I, I don't accept it. I, 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 I think it's dangerous and getting people killed. The, the reality is, is the, the police, we are feeding billions of dollars of taxes all over this country into training police officers so Negative. they know what to do. So, it, it, and the reality is nobody wants to talk about creating other public safety apparatuses for police. Nobody wants to talk about diverting some of that money. But then when a police officer misbehaves, they, we say they're human. I understand that police officers are human. And if you can't handle a high stress situation, please go be a used car salesman. I agree. So, so, so what, what I'm saying is I get that people are human, but where you're signing up for a job that's supposed to, in a degree, make you more likely to de-escalate a situation to where you can apply the stuff that you've learned for a safe outcome for the citizens you're trying to protect. So the I'm a human thing. I cannot begin to accept that that explanation as to why these things keep happening. Now, uh, that's an aside. I would love to hear what you guys have to say because Rachel asked a fantastic question. I would love to hear what you guys have to say about qualified immunity. Absolutely. I think every officer should be held accountable. If they messed up, they got to pay for it. It just it comes with the territory. I agree with you 100%, Rachel. I, I agree 1,000% with it. That's the only way, that's the only way you're going to stop Unfortunately, it's the only way you're gonna you're gonna stop and hold and, and actually hold officers accountable for their actions. But but also with policing, listen, nothing easier about policing. So even if you're making a, a decision instantaneously and it was the right decision, you're still you're still gonna be you're still gonna be talked about it. Well, you didn't have to kill him, even if it was a, a, a phenomenal good shoot. You're still going to have the people saying, well, you shouldn't have did that. Now, that's the only thing what bothers me. It's like, if I did the job like I'm supposed to have and made the right call when I had to, you still want to sue me? Give me an example of a, of a situation where you feel like... It could, it could, be, it could be any situation where, where there was a good shoot and, so, and somebody lost their well, life. Can you think of it? Because we have dozens okay. of examples of, of over the course of the... Like, can you think of any one of these that was a quote-unquote good shoot to where an officer was unfairly criticized for the way one of these things turned out. And I asked that question, I asked that question sincerely with no malice because I'm 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 interested in what do you what do you think give me one of these that was a good shoot to where you feel well, like I, I'll give a good example of one of our um 
uh, one of our guys that we had on our podcast. Um, he's a supervisor. Uh, he got involved in a foot pursuit. A gentleman he got involved in foot, with the foot pursuit pulled out a, uh, a firearm, pointed at him. He told him drop it. He didn't drop. It. So he had to, he incapacitated that individual. Everything by the book. Foot pursuit, drop the gun. Foot the foot pursuit, drop the gun. Not listening. He incapacitated the individual. He's still trying to get the family. Still trying to sue that 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 sergeant now. But why? Why? It was a good shoot. Well, why? Because everything. probably why? Probably because they're grieving. Look, I'm I I I don't know why they're doing what they're doing. And the reality is, if you train your gun, I don't. You don't have to be a cop. I got a shotgun under my bed. If you come in this crib right here and you put a gun on me, if I got that, you're going to sleep. Okay. So, so I, I, I get that. You got that, the right to I, bear arms. And, I agree and with I, you. Yeah, and I, I get that, and I understand that, right? I'm going to protect my family and protect my household. The reality of that is that the gun is where it is, where it needs to be. I'm not around here talking about how big, making a big deal about wanting to hurt people or having guns. I grew up in a place where, I, where, where we had firearms, where we had weapons, and so I have one to defend my home, okay? I'm not, I don't think anybody is talking about what you're talking about. And I, I, I get it. I understand it. I don't think that qualified immunity is meant for that. I don't think anyone's talking about that. I think if, if a situation where any American would be armed and has a gun on them and they can't talk to the person, reacting with deadly force in that situation, nobody is going to begrudge you that, especially after an investigation proves whatever, whatever. But in these situations we're talking about, by and large, the overwhelming majority, we're talking about unarmed black people. We're talking about black people that were running. We're talking about black people that were stopped for poverty crimes, like selling loose cigarettes or uh, uh, allegedly using a, 20, a collar fit 20. Killed, extinguished before our eyes. And those are layups. And so to me, I'm not even looking at it, and God, for, God forgive me for using those people's human lives as layups. I'm talking about we can't use an exception of what if there's a good shoot. We're talking about the bad ones. And, the, and, and, the and, bad I, ones. and I, I just agree with that. Yeah. I just gave you an example of why officers shouldn't get held civil liable if it's a good shoot. That's a great example because it's happening. And they're phenomenal shoots. But we're still being held liable. Why? Because we did our job and it's, we did it and we did it to a T. So sorry, I agree Rachel. with these last two instances. Uh, and go ahead. I'm sorry, Rachel. You have something else you want to add? No, no, no. Finish it. Finish it. it. It's a conversation. We don't have to. We don't have to do the no, whole thing. It's an amazing thing. conversation. Like, no, let's I love just, it. Let's just talk. I love it. So, yeah, yeah. So no, go ahead. Finish. On. So we got ten years on. You don't think we've been in those situations where we approach a guy that's selling loose cigarettes and the outcome came out beautiful, and that's why I never made news. We've been. I had guns pointed at me. I've been in fights, and it's the, it's it's the job. But we have the training. This is why we created the podcast to also let everybody know that, yes, we are police officers. But in the 10 years, we have zero, zero deaths under our belt because of the way we handle people. Can I ask you a and question? that's just the way we handle it. So Here, we're, we're just trained a little bit different, and we 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 trust our training. I'll tell you okay. one thing. From, you have, you from, have, like, I, have, I have a question. I'll ask you guys both this then. You have zero deaths, which is a just a, a shocking bar for success on the job, but... Well, Van, um, Van, it's not shocking because here in Baltimore City, I don't know if you know, but... Cops it's, are killing people all the time? Here. It's like, busy down here. But cop, nope. cops are... It, it, routinely, cops are killing people in Baltimore? No, no, no. Routinely, cops are dealing with one of the deadliest criminals that this country has to offer. Fair enough. And, okay. Um, no, go ahead. Go ahead. My man. My bad, my man. And, you know, there's, it's always a positive outcome because of the way we treat people. It's all. It's all. In, it's all in how you say and how you say. It. We've had. I've had. We've had. We've had. I don't even want to mention gangs, but we've had gang leaders see us and they're like, you know what? I respect you guys. Today's not the day, and it's a mutual respect. As crazy as it sounds, there's no need to poke the bear. You understand what I'm so, saying? I, all right. I, I, I'll ask you this: You say you have zero deaths in ten years on. Can each of you say that you have zero brutality complaints? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. My, okay. My, Absolutely. My fault is clear. I would, like, I would like. I would like you to call our ID and ask them. I'm no, I'm, look, look, I'm just making sure. Of look, course. Look, uh, Man, look. Listen, we love what we do. Van, we could walk through Baltimore City without. I go to Baltimore City all the time, right? Yeah. With no handgun, because I know I'm okay. Why? Okay. I know I've treated everybody I've come across with respect. But but is there a level of comfortability coming from you because of the way that you look? Because I think what we're seeing in a lot of these cases, sorry, that's my dog. It's okay. What I think what I think we're so, we're seeing a lot is this um, people feel automatic. There's just perceived perceived threat coming from officers when they approach a certain person that they're pulling over or that they perceive to be more threatening than they are. You seem to be very comfortable because of where you, you like you started off talking about where you come from, who you are, uh, how you present yourself, where maybe another officer feels a little bit more scared. Is there, and, and that's, so I think I see a lot of people talking about racial sensitivity training uh, or the lack thereof. I think that's an issue that we have yet to talk about right now in this conversation because some people feel more like they're willing to put put their hand on the trigger just because they're they, they feel that there's a perceived threat when there isn't one just based off the way a person looks. Right. So we have a good friend of ours. He's the Italian Stanley. That's what we call him. He's an Italian American man who can go to any neighborhood in Baltimore City and be fine. Why? Because of the way he treats people. Respect. Italian. Uh. You know. Fair skin. Everything. He's never had a problem because he treats everyone with respect. Rachel, I I, I agree. A thousand percent with you, but in order for there to be change, that's why I said it's it's good for our white brothers, our white sisters that haven't came and not used to the city, that don't understand the culture. It's good for them to get involved and dive right in, go out and introduce yourself. The only way the only way you can get across that is by breaking that barrier. You got to have uncomfortable conversations to get across anywhere or to make a change. So I love. Are you from this area? No, I right, come with me. We 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 gonna go out. We gonna talk. To, we gonna talk to the boys on the block. We gonna talk to our business owners. You got to get out of your comfort zone and talk to these people and bridge that gap and build that rapport because that's the only way. That's the only way things are come together, and that's the only way you'll really see change. Because oh, it's funny. We had a lieutenant from the fire department, and we had him on. We had him on the podcast, right? So everything went well. It was a great, it, it, the interview was great that we conducted. And then he got to the point where he said, you know, when I get out of work, I don't deal with police. I really don't like police. And we was like, huh? And he got over 21 years on. He's a lieutenant in the fire department. So I said, over your years of service, how do you still not like police? And he's like, well, you know, I had a situation when I was young and an officer made me, you know, I had to put my knees down in, in glass, and he made me get down face fl- face floor on the on, on the concrete. So I understood that. That shit broke my heart. And it, 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 and it's bad. And I said, "Yo, you carry that with you all these years, bro?" And he said, "Yeah." And I said, "Well, you know, it's unfortunate because I would think him being on the job for over twenty years, we work hand in hand with the fire department. So I would think, you know, <laughs> the rapport and everything would be there. But people still carry that, and I understand that." But that's why, you know, that's another reason why our podcast was created, because we're all about building rapport and bridging the gap. Right. It's interesting with the fire department. Like, if the fire department came over to your house to rescue a cat out of a tree and they ended up burning your house down, I don't think you would ever, I don't think you'd ever, you'd ever forget that. Tell you guys the story real quick, and then I want to ask you a, a very direct question. When I was 15, I'm in my driveway. 15-year-old kid in my driveway. Which in my city? Driveway. What city? What city? Baton Rouge, Louisiana. All okay. Right? Um, so 15 of them in my driveway. I'm doing my homework, right? Cops come on. I like the way you see the last coming in. Yeah, <laughs> cops. Uh, <laughs> cops could uh, cops come around. They uh, they they see me. They say, "Stand up. You got anything on you?" Uh, you know, pat me down, pat my pockets down, and stuff like that. I'm like, "What's happening?" I'm in my driveway. When I say I'm in the drive, I'm not like my. Don't even go out. Like I was on punishment. I couldn't leave off the house grounds. So I'm just wanted to be outside. I'm in the driveway, sitting down, doing my homework. Cops uh, stand me up. They cuff me. Walk me over. Like, like do whatever. They're checking out whatever they have to check out. I'm like, I'm 15 years old. But at that time, I'm about 6'4 now. At that time, I'm probably like 6'1", 6'2". 
I, I, I fit some sort of description. They're asking me all kinds of questions and stuff. I didn't even know enough about the world to be scared. It wasn't until my father got wind of that, that that was, it was, it crystallized to me what a big deal that was. Hadn't done anything. Cuffed. And then, and then, and then let me go. Go back and I, go back and sit down. My, my, people lose it, right? For me, growing up, the cops were the predators. Like the police were the ones. See all the violence that went in that went on in South Baton Rouge. I understood that. What I didn't understand was why you would put me in handcuffs for doing my homework. And it, it, I, I give you guys a million dollars worth of credit for coming on this podcast today, especially in the times that you're in that, that we're in right now. Couldn't give you more credit, but I. Do not believe in policing anymore. I want you I to wish come I to did. Baltimore. Come to I, Baltimore. I, 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 want you, I want you to come I, so we I can wish take I, you I really wish I did. I wish I did. You too, Rachel. No one would want it to be this way. I wish I did, but I don't believe in it. Let me ask you one question. Baltimore City has a five, five. Baltimore City has a 500, and I, by the way, I am coming to Baltimore. I, I'm, I'm dead serious. I, no, no, no. I, I will, because we did a podcast on The Wire, and the people keep asking me to come down there. Um, I, like I am gonna come to Baltimore, and when I come to Baltimore, I'm, I'm gonna tap in with y'all for real. Because, because, yeah, seriously, yeah, like, like, we want to so, see y'all t-shirts, so we need your address as well. No, right, but tap so, in, we'll take care of y'all. So, 550 million dollar police budget in Baltimore City. I think it just got cut a little bit more. It might be haircut down to like five, five, nine, five, ten, or something like that. People talk about defunding or uh, sort of not defunding, redirecting police dollars. Do you think it makes sense, Baltimore City, to have a $500 million police budget? Couldn't two, $250 million of that money be spent in areas where people need it to set up public safety commissions, to set up other things that enrich communities so that we're not just band-aiding these situations with more guns and more troops, that we're actually dealing with them from the ground up? When people say defund or divest from the police, why is that such an incredibly dirty word or dirty phrase to people that are supposed to want people to be safe? Of course, they would be more safe if there were more resources, right? Absolutely. I don't think it's a dirty word. I, I just think we need to have a clear understanding on where this front end, where the money's going to. Because I agree wholeheartedly. These young kids out here, they got no direction. They used to be PAO pal centers. There's none of that here anymore. Hasn't been here for a long time. So I, I'm, I'm more, I love that. I love that. Listen, I also want to implement boxing. Give them something to do. These kids need something. They need a place to go to after school. They need, they need, to, they need to know that, we, that they're loved. And that's not just from the police. That's from everybody. You know, it, it takes a village to raise a child. And that's true. I do not mind if they cut our budget and then putting the money in a program where they're taking high school kids that maybe do not want to go to college and they want to become an electrician or a plumber in a trade. But that's above our pay grade. I mean, we, we, we got a harbor. Te teach them how to fish. Teach them how to fish. We had a, um, a Baltimore City uh, candidate that was running for mayor. And he said, if we teach them how to fish, one, one kid will become a cook. One kid will become a chef. You, you see what I'm saying? One kid will buy a boat and actually be the fisherman. And we believe in that wholeheartedly. I, I would, you, you can take the money out of my budget if I know kids are learning a trade. I'm absolutely with that. But, you know, certain things happen that's above our pay grade that, you know, we're not at the freedom to speak about. Rach, mm. you got anything else? I just want to ask you a general question. When you, in light of what is currently happening right now in our country, when you look at cases like what happened in uh, Virginia, when you look at what just happened in Brooklyn Center, when you look at what's happening currently in the trial in Minneapolis, are they to you more of a result of how policing works in America? Or does it have to do more with our ongoing struggles about race or around race in this country? I think it's it's accumulation of everything. And police the police reform needs to be in every department. Because, of course, you know, old policing and traditions back then, I can't speak about that. I can only speak about the tradition that I'm in and the new and the new style of policing, which makes sense. Because we're about, what, six years uh, post-Freddie Gray? We're, we're, we're the poster child for police reform. 
So the department has changed. And, and I love what we do. We love working in Baltimore City. It's phenomenal. I advise everybody to come out here. But I, I agree. I agree with you, Rachel. I think it, it takes it, it takes everybody to come and make this change. And, you know, to build reform. Reform is great. It's only going to put... It's only going to put the, the, the best product out there to serve and be that real agent for your for your department and not do what you want to do, but do what you have to do and what's right and, 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 and do what's, what's built in, in purpose for you and follow out your, 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 uh, your policies and procedures. Also, the community benefits out of that. Of course. You know, they get the, pre- the best product out there. You know, they get the best help. So I'll tell cool. you, uh, one of our episodes is what, uh, hey, Van, look him up. Peanut King. Peanut King was, what can I say? The biggest. The biggest. I do drug know who you're talking Maryland. about. I do. Listen, I do the know. biggest. Van, yeah, the biggest. I do know who you're talking about. He came Bro, down. Bro, he did 37 years flat federal. He got out 18 months ago and he came and did an interview with us. Knowing he don't, knowing he, can I, can I be blunt? Knowing he don't fuck with police at all. And he sat with us for about two hours. If you listen to the interview at the beginning, the first 20, 30 minutes was a little rocky because, of course, look at his background. Look at what he's did for a living. He didn't trust us. And now he's coming to two detectives that he don't even know from Adam. And as he sat and spoke with us, you can see the building rapport. About an hour into it, oh, we had so much fun. And he understood what we was trying to, what we was trying to do in bridging the gap and really getting out there because we come from it. Trust me. He actually invited us. He invited us. When he left, he came back 20 minutes later and stayed for another two hours. He invited us because he's setting up a community like center. He invited us to be a part of it so that the little kids could see that, you know, not all police officers are bad. But I love the conversing. I love the questions. What else you got? We're cooking. What's up? We're about to let y'all That's go. What doing. <laughs> so, so uh, the last thing I'll say to y'all is this. Um, and then, uh, look, I, I would like to believe in some of the stuff that you guys have said here today. I just, American policing is is either one or two things. It's either fundamentally and irreparably broken. Absolutely. Or it's operating just as it was intended to the entire time. I agree. Both, Both of those things are chilling. I don't know how we reconcile it. You guys are on the ground there in Baltimore. And I don't know your hearts, but I know the, what, we, what we've talked about right now. The only thing I can ask is if you see people that look like me, people that look, people, period, being treated poorly by police, please, please put blood in front of blue. Put human beings in front of a shield or a badge or a uniform because they're supposed to be protecting us. Right, then we, we keep we getting stand, chalked out. So what, what, I, what I'm what, what I'm trying to say is, I don't know what the fuck got to happen, man. But something got to give in this whole situation, bro. Something that's why I know change. I know you just met us, but that's what we stand on. That's what we do every day, every, and that's what we preach to our fellow coworkers. We put blood before blue. We put respect before anything, and we look at everything not as a color, but good or bad and that's it there's no gray area there's no either you you know you got a gun and you got to go to jail because you know you bothering you know miss after that's you know trying to go to the store you got to go but other than that it's it's all either good and bad and blood before blue always and that's why we have such a great reputation in any neighborhood in this town i think it's going to take all of us along along with you and, and rachel you guys are doing us as well Let's continue to build. Let's continue to converse. Let's let's continue to and reach other people, because th- that's what it's about. Ultimately, we should all be in this for the for the same common goal. Absolutely. And and we don't mind it because we're the only ones doing this in this lane. You're not you're not you're not gonna get the swag. You're not gonna get the skin smelling good. You're not gonna get none of that from nowhere else but us. And how we bring it to you? It's raw, but it's truth. I guarantee you're not gonna find another police podcast that talk that talk how we talk. I right, appreciate you, brothers, for stopping by today, man. Yes, you. thank you. Double thank you for being here. Silverbackchronicles.com. We appreciate you. Shout it you. out we again. So, like, real clean so everybody know where, where, where to find y'all at. www.silverbackchronicles.com. On Instagram, it's silverbackpod, P-O-D. And don't forget, 
We appreciate you. We love you. You guys got a red carpet. Come to the town. We'll take hey, care don't, of you. Hey, Van. Van and Rachel, come to Baltimore. I'm telling you, we you got said a spot. You was coming. Fell's Point, we got a spot for you. It's all oh, right. no, I'm like, coming down there. I like there. Baltimore. I'm, I'm coming come. down there. I don't, I don't want to have to rat y'all out, though. I don't want to have to be, Stop. you know, I don't want to have to, <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't want to, yeah, I don't, I, you guys are with us and they with us. That's it. You're good. All right. All right, y'all. All right, peace, <laughs> All right, y'all. Thank you right. so much for being here. Be safe. Thank you. Peace and love. Same to you. Okay, Rach, did you learn anything from that? No. I learned nice, who... Nice guys. Didn't I was going to say, I learned who they are. I learned what they do. Um, but as far as our questions are concerned, unfortunately, we didn't get any answers. I didn't get any clarification. I didn't get any... Uh, understanding to wh- how the system works, how we feel uh, within it, and um, where we go from here. Didn't get any of that, unfortunately. Right. Uh, seems like two well-meaning guys. Exactly. It's going t- it, 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 to take more than nice cops to fix American policing. It's going to take systemic overhaul and a hard look Right. And the decisions that we're making with the resources that we have. It's a serious conversation. And I think they know that. Okay. Uh, so, um, Patrice Colors, do you know who that is? Yes. She Co-founder. is one of the founders of Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, you guys, if you didn't know this, you're like a you're probably a Karen if I have to explain this to you. <laughs> but yes, Black Lives Matter is both a mantra and a specific organization. Correct. She's Colors, one of the founders of that organization. It was recently, <laughs> I don't know if this was just discovered or someone reported. I guess reported is the right word. It seems like it was just discovered. Um, that Patrice Colors has bought four high-end homes in these United States for $3.2 million. So <laughs> a lot of people are asking questions. Now, this comes on the heels of a couple of weeks ago, it being announced that Black Lives Matter bought in $90 million worth of donations last year. 90 million bucks. So BLM is not just like an organization. BLM is also apparently like a fucking star center fielder for the Yankees getting 90 million a year. <laughs> hey, I don't even think that they made that much. Like, with like, yeah, like what is, what is, what is, yeah, the, they do. I don't think they make 90 million a year. The highest paid baseball player, I think, is uh, is Mike Trout. Didn't Mike Trout sign an ungodly contract? Yeah. I don't think Mike Trout made, I don't think there's anyone in Major League Baseball making 90 million a year. I don't think okay. so. I think there okay. are other athletes okay. who make a lot more, but that's like endorsements and all of that stuff. No, he makes $33 million a year, Mike Trout does. Okay. Let's look at but this. But the contract let's, let's see if worth, anybody makes, the contract let's see if is any, worth $430 million. $430, but it's not for like four years. It's probably for like 10. It's like 12. <laughs> so let's see if there's any athletes that make as much, that made as much last year, just in contract, as BLM. BLM out here putting up numbers, boy. A uh, highest earning athlete. Looks like there's a couple. Okay, talk to me. Number one, Roger Federer, 106 million. This that is doesn't tw- count. Okay. Why? You, you want American athletes? Because uh, to, no, I'll tell you why Roger Federer doesn't count. Because Roger Federer, because that's like prize money and stuff. And that's also got to be endorsements and stuff like it that. It doesn't talking- matter. That's how much they made. It okay. doesn't matter. In one year. Okay. And if we're including endorsements and everything, According to yardbarker.com, there's five athletes that that made that much. Number one was Roger Federer, 106 million. Number two, Ronaldo, 105 million. Number three, Messi, 104 million. Number four, LeBron James, 99.2 million. Number five, Neymar, 95.5. Gosh, Just three soccer players. Three Good soccer players. Soccer, I'm telling you, t- teach them kids to kick that damn ball. They be kicking that ball and making right. that money. Our child um, will play soccer. Yeah, so all, we, we say this to say, hey, by the way, love BLM. Love BLM. $90 million. That's Is there a money. butt coming? Is there a there, butt coming? No, 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 no. There's no butt coming. Okay. That's a lot of money, though. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, and, well, so why is that a problem? Why are we talking about this? Why is that it's a not a problem? Okay, so so, so but, why are you talking about it? So here's the thing. It's just it's a topic. So Patrice Colors mm-hmm. is uh, one of the heads of BLM, and she bought all of these houses. So there are people that are passively, if not outright, accusing Pol- Patrice Colors of grift in this situation. <laughs> um, add that to the point that she is a self-described socialist. A lot of people are asking for answers in this situation. One of the people who is asking for answers, for, fucking forget about what Jason Whitlock has to say. I can't even believe oh, yeah, y'all put yeah, that yeah, in. Yeah, 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 fucking yeah, yeah. forget about him. Um, but there are other activists who are you know, yes. asking questions about what's happening with this money. Specifically, so, heads of Black Lives Matter chapters in other cities. Are so, asking. So, so, the, so Patrice is over the, in, like, the original, like, created it all. Now there are all these local chapters. So specifically, heads of local chapters are calling this into question, are wondering Newsom, where their money is. Who is the head of Black Lives Matter, uh, Greater New York City, wants a probe. He says, if you go around calling yourself a socialist, you have to ask how much of her own personal money is going to charitable causes. Now, I should say this. Patrice Colors does a lot of things, guys. Patrice Colors, I'm That's sure... That's not is, what he's saying. He's not saying he, she doesn't. I, I know. But what I'm saying is there might be... People might be making a corollary between Black Lives Matter having $90 million, which is a lot of fucking money, okay? And Patrice Colors buying three houses. Patrice Colors writes books. Patrice Colors, uh, I'm sure, does speaking engagements where she gets paid. I'm sure Patrice Colors is making money away from donations that have to do with Black Lives Matter. You look skeptical and I want to hear from you. Because it's not, nobody is mad at Patrice for making income on the side. Nobody's mad for her for, her for making income um, and using her platform to spread awareness about why Black Lives Matter and how we can continue to further that narrative. The problem is that she's a self-proclaimed Marxist, which is anti-capitalism. So the fact that she is out here buying multiple homes, not one home to live in, because that's all we need, right? Right? We only need one home to live. Patrice is buying homes in Georgia, Inglewood, South Central LA. Is it Topanga Canyon? Is that what it's called? Topanga. Topanga Canyon. And is rumored to be looking at a spot in the Bahamas with her wife. So what? That doesn't sound like a Marxist. Okay. And that's so why people are upset. So, that's what it is. So that's, okay, so she's so maybe she's a bad Marxist. Maybe well, she's she, not no, good no, at it. It's not maybe. She is. And so, First so of all, how many, how, many, how, how many homes did Karl Marx have? I don't know. I bet that nigga had a gang No, don't home. bet and assume. We don't I'm know. Gonna, no, no, I'm going to look it up. Because I bet like, Karl Marx... I guess, as much as I guess t- here's my thing. Nobody, I'm not taking away from what she does for BLM. Right. I'm not taking away from that. I'm not mad at her for getting a deal with Warner Brothers. Uh, I'm not she mad has an at overall her for, deal with Warner Brothers, yeah. Yeah, I'm not mad at her for, for, for speaking engagements, for writing books, because all she's doing is furthering the narrative. So good for her. I think right. the, what people are struggling with is, one, these local chapters are saying they are not seeing the money from the $90 million that BLM earned nationally. Not even just what you mentioned with the, the Greater New York City chapter. Uh, you've got... Uh, uh, Michael Brown's father in Ferguson, Ferguson saying that they've never received money from BLM. And they apparently were supposed to give about 21, 20 million plus dollars to these local chapters. And you have other chapters saying they're not getting this money, yet Patrice is out here buying homes. You know, like Clearly she's a millionaire because she's buying million dollar homes. So my, that's where people are upset about, what people are upset about. Also you saying you learned at a very young age what it is to be a Marxist. And you you believe that. You embody those ideals. So to me, if you embody that, you don't have four homes looking for a fifth home in the Bahamas. You got one. Do we know what she plans to do with I don't care that homes. she lives in white neighborhoods. I think all that is bullshit. All that, oh, she lives in a white neighborhood. Forget that. That's not the do issue. We, we, do, we, do we know what she plans to do with the homes? Maybe she's buying homes. Man, I'm not gonna I'm not here. I'm not here to have a conversation on assumptions. The fact that she owns the home. And the the million dollar home and the million dollar home she put in her LLC. Yeah, I'm saying. She didn't even put it under her name. So maybe she's maybe she's doing the Patrice Colors 
school of Marxism. And she got different chapters. She got a chapter. Let me know in, where you can enroll. Let me know where I can enroll. She got a chapter in the Bahamas. I'll she go to the Tanga. Inglewood one. She got Let Georgia. Me know. I, look, I do listen, I kid, but I do think this. it's the contradiction. People, it's the contradiction. Yeah, I think a lot of people are up in arms about this. I don't expect a vow of poverty from anyone who is at the forefront of this movement. Um, I don't sure. expect a vow of poverty. Uh, I don't know. I've met Patrice one time. Uh I personally don't know enough about Patrice Colors to say that she is some sort of hypocrite. I think mm. that a lot of people are going to look at that and then say, you know, they, mm. these things don't align. But I've never had a conversation with her about her views. Okay. She has, well, no, I'm just saying she has a YouTube video where she talks about being a Marxist. She's like, everyone keeps saying this about me. She's reading old tweets. And then she's like, let me talk, tell you what I am. I am that. And I learned this at a very young age. I'm not knocking her for, uh, I, I, I just think it's the contradiction that's hard for people to swallow. Sure. I think the fact that some of these local chapters haven't received money. I think the fact that BLM at, on a national front is not forthcoming about how their money is given out. I think people want to know personally, is she giving money out? Because that embodies also uh, um, uh, Marxism. And so I think that's what it is. I I want everybody to understand, I am not knocking the work that Patrice has done and continues to do. And I hope to see more of it. It's just the contradiction. Mm, of The contradiction. If she never said she... If you she like nev- this. No, you're you're liking this. You are full, and you are full of assumptions in this <laughs> segment. That's all you're doing. I, I think it, it. Listen, if she never said that, if she was just like BLM and this, and then she bought four houses, I don't think anybody would have anything to say. All right. Okay. Look, it. it's an interesting uh, story, and it gives an oh, it just undermines. It gives it gives the other side an excuse to point fingers. It gives the other side to, uh, an opportunity to try to undermine the work, the beautiful work. Well, this is that where this, a lot of this comes and from. That's what I hate. A lot that's of this comes from people who want to shoot holes in the sincerity of Patrice and other people like well, her. I'm, so, I'm not, not asking questions now. Where do, where no, do no, 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 no. Look, I get it. I get it. I think that um, the. The higher up your perch, the more people want to believe in the purity of your message. And if there, if it doesn't ring true with some people, some people are probably going to have some problems with it. You know what I mean? But, you know, I looked at it and when people were like, she just bought a $1.4 million home. The first thing I thought was, in LA, that ain't right. shit. Right. Same. You know what I'm saying? We looking for a house right now. We trying to pay around that same amount. And Come on, God, man. God damn. It's like, it's, it's it looking. It must be nice, man. No, whatever, man. It's look, you know you got more money than me. Who sponsors that sweater, Rachel? Well, I'm so uh, glad you asked, man. This this sweater is sponsored by feet. See? See, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So, but what I'm saying is that uh 1.4 million in LA is not exactly that you guys. I don't want to It's a lot like, of mm-hmm. money. It's a lot of money, but it's but for LA. For the houses that are out here, you know what? Go in Zillow. And look up a $1.4 million house in LA. And I'm telling you, it's going to stop you from moving out here. You're going to be like, fuck that. I'm staying in Scottsdale. Because I could get a whole fucking mansion for what, you right. know. It's just like, it doesn't go as far. So, anyway. All right. Um, Did you see Saturday Night Live? Wait, which part? She which part? It. Oh, do you know what I was thinking of? Yes, thinking I saw about? it. The iceberg. Bo and Yang playing oh, yes. the iceberg from the Titanic. That was really funny. But yes, I, did, I saw it. Yes, I funny. saw Saturday Night Live. It's very funny. <laughs> it's very, very funny. I got to admit, it's funny. It but did was. you see Kid Cudi's performance? I did. So you guys don't know Kid Cudi uh, performed Saturday Night Live this past Saturday night. Um, and he said that he was paying tribute to Kurt Cobain. And he yeah. wore an outfit that Kurt Cobain had worn. And he also wore a dress similar to one that Kurt Cobain wore when he was still alive. And Virgil Abloh uh, made the dress. This got people going. People were so upset that Kid Cudi wore a dress. It was very upset. I thought, I, I got to be honest with you. Maybe, I folks, it takes more than a dress. It's like, we still get mad over the same shit. Folks. The dress has been around. People been getting mad at guys' <laughs> dresses since like 
to fifties. Like what is that new? Not gonna piss people off no more. Like, it's not even fuck? shocking. What are you mad about? It's not even that shocking to see. I'm sorry. Could Kid Cudi performed in dress. Personally, wasn't a fan of the dress. That was more my bigger issue. I didn't, he said it was going like to be a dress? part of. No, I said it was going to be a part of a new line. I said, let me see the rest of the line. I will not be buying that floral dress. Uh, but I, what's the big deal? And he was paying tribute to Kurt Cobain. If you know Kurt Cobain, he was all about, I guess, stopping some of these stereotypes that we have for certain genders. And he was really an activist back in his day when it wasn't popular. He was wearing dresses. He was for... Um, the LGBTQ plus community. He was for women. He was like, he was break, trying to break these things down even before it became trendy like it is now. So good for Kid Cudi for representing that. Yeah. I mean, all that's true, but at the same time, come on guys. Like, I don't like this. Like we can't, we, we have to, we have to define our, we have to really make rules about our outrage. Okay. So yeah. a couple of weeks ago, this was like light work. A couple of weeks ago, Lil Nas X, who we love, by the way, stop with the mail. Stop with the mail. Okay? If, if we're going to be outraged about the Lil Nas X thing, right? Going down there dancing with Satan, then we got to let the dress slide. Going down there dancing with Satan. Like we, it's, 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 <laughs> you can't be mad over everything. It's like, if I'm Lil Nas X right now, I'm actually pissed off about this. I'm like, yo, man, that don't mean he don't deserve none of this. Look what I did. I made you question your entire religion. Who is that? Oh, that's you and Lil Nas X? When did he come through? The Super Bowl last year. This oh, is before, before he found Satan. So, uh, so you love, so you turned your back on him. I did not turn my back on you him. Did, Stop. Because I'm going to be honest with you, because most people, shout out to all of my homies, shout out to Jared Hill, who we're going to have on the podcast. We still need to have Jared, uh, Jared, Who's after Jared? Jared Hill on the podcast. Um, who, I talked to so many of my LGBT friends who talked to me about the real significance of the Lil Nas X video and how they felt about it. Now, does that mean that I'm all pro-Satan now? No. But it's so interesting to hear a human experience that is so far away from yours being expressed to you in such a moving way. Not that people should need that from other groups in order to get behind what they're what they're talking about, but it's just very hard to listen to it and not come away like, nah, I see what you're talking about. I, I get, get that. I get I it. I get that. But what I'm saying is, we gotta like set an outrage. Were scale. people really that I, I knew everyone so was talking about it? I did not know people were outraged about it. You know what I, mean? I thought he looked great. The dress wasn't for me, but if it was in a different design, maybe. But I thought he looked great. Who cares? He's paying a tribute to I, people. My, people you know just what? want look, I, like look to be mad. Me up like, Van, you see what they're trying to do to us? You see how they're trying to take our masculinity? See what they're trying so to do? So what they say when Young Thug wore a dress on, a, on the album cover? My point is, this is like, what, this like, is what are we doing here? This it's is like, it's like what, we, we've been doing this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, the, you I know don't who, the, the, the only the only person who ever really escaped this this type of scrutiny was Prince. It didn't fucking matter. I knew matter. you were gonna say that, but Prince didn't wear dresses, did he? But Prince wore whatever he wanted to wear. If he wanted to wear a dress, if he wanted to wear a blouse, if he wanted to whatever, and Prince people wanted, criticized it. And I don't he think didn't they care. Not like that. Yes, they did. People, it was like, oh, don't, he was vulgar. Don't watch him. Like, that's like, yeah, people, and I love me some Prince. Love me some Prince. Do you know, do you know Prince, as we're, as we're talking about Prince, we're coming up on the anniversary of his death. You know, he died on my birthday. It was a sad, it's, I always remember that. It's always going to be a sad day. <sighs> Prince is my first concert. So Just you went the to the you went to the musicology tour then, didn't you? Yes, I did. I did too. Just as that's, the podcast. That's what I that's what I get I get comfort in is knowing that I saw him getting in away concert from the dour way in which it started. Rachel has to go and remind us that we're coming up on the anniversary of the death. I'm the sorry, I'm never position. gonna forget that. I, won't I cried on the plane. The entire way. I found out before takeoff, I landed. Dallas, just, 
Dallas. We've been to Scottsdale. Dallas to Phoenix was one of Scottsdale. I will never forget. Yeah, mm-hmm. Hey, back up. Mm-hmm. Off Kid mm-hmm. Cudi. You guys relax. I'm telling you, man. Seriously. There's more stuff to get mad about. Kid Cudi. Van, what we going to do? So, Van, you got a big platform. What you going to do to make sure they don't take away from the masculine man's facilities and that we we can still be masculine and not be uh, as masculine as we're supposed to be. They're trying to demasculate us and turn us into men are, less masculine. Men are stupid. Let me tell you something. I'm here to say men are stupid. We got enough of y'all out here so? to remind us, remind us. You think men are stupid? How, quote, masculine you are. You, you'd say that. I think, say it that. Takes more of a, I think it takes more of a man to put on a dress on national TV and sing a song than it does to play into certain stereotypes that are associated with your gender. So you think, you think that's ahead, okay Kate to Cuddy. say? You think that's okay to just say blanket, men are stupid, like we're stupid? You're stupid. I mean. I didn't stutter. I mean, we're we're stupid. What do you consider to be stupid? Like, why are we stupid? That comment right there. What why? we going to do? What we going to do, Van? What we going to hey, do? Van, what we going to do? You out here, bro. You got to You know what you going to do? You know what you going to do? You going to shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you going to do. <laughs> That's what you're going to do. What's the next time? <laughs> man, man, we got to stop them. They're trying to use their agendas. <laughs> Get the fuck out of my face with that shit. Crazy ass motherfucker. Don't give a fuck about what you say. <laughs> I don't care about what you say. I don't care. All right, let's take a break. Uh, Kyrie Irving is... Um, we got kicked out of the game this past Adam, Saturday. Yeah. He got picked, kicked out of the game this past Saturday. He got ejected. Me and Caligua were watching the game, and Kyrie Irving got ejected. He was very upset. And then they kicked Dennis Schroeder out of the game, too. Uh, Dennis Schroeder, should I say, out of the game, too. They were both very mad. They were both cooking at this time. Lakers went on to a smack of a smack, the smack um, the, the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, Much-needed victory for the Lakers. It came out after this that the reason why Kyrie Irving was kicked out of his game was because he got pissed off that Dennis Schroeder who is black, used the N-word towards him. Kyrie Irving uh, then took to Twitter. And this is what he tweeted. The tweet is still up. And what he tweeted was this. He said, the N-word is a derogatory racial slur. It will never be a term of endearment, reclaimed, flipped. Never forget its foul and true history. Throw that N-word out the window right alongside all of those other racist words used to describe my people. We are not slaves or ends. This is Kyrie Irving who said this. Uh, I guess Dennis Schroeder called him that. He flipped out. Well, he didn't flip out. He got upset. They kicked him out the game. And then he decided that he wasn't playing today because of personal reasons. So, uh, and I know, I'm not saying that this necessarily has anything to do with what happened on the court. Uh, I don't know what's going on with Kyrie Irving. It could be something very serious, or it could be the Kyrie Irving just decided he didn't want to play today. Or it could be what's happening right now in our country, which we know he's been very vocal. Very vocal uh, about, about. Yeah. yeah very vocal yeah. about. And by the way, there's something that they're doing in the NBA called load management. And guys sometimes decide, or coaches decide for guys, that uh, this game is just going to be bad on your body, hard on your body, and I'm not going to play. What do you think about Kyrie Irving's opinion on the N word? I you- think that's his prerogative. I have I feel nothing towards it. If he listen, every to each their own. Some people are offended by the word, even black people. Uh, some people are not. I have a hard time feeling like his teammates don't say it around him or at him. I feel like um, maybe he doesn't like somebody he doesn't know that well saying that. I don't, I'm not sure the reason, but I see no problem with this. If Kyrie does not want the word used around him, if he does not want to be referred to that, if he does not want to be called out of his name, then that is his right. And I see no problems with this. I see no problem with him getting upset. It's not me, but that's Kyrie. You got a problem with it? I don't like it. That's his how he feels. He has the right to not be called that word if he doesn't want to. He does. Thank but you. This is my thing. You got to let people know that. Oh, okay. That's you an did. impossible task you're asking upon. Well, him. he already he, he just wear did a t-shirt. It. Now he did. Which was do wear a t-shirt. He, he just did. But you can't be mad at somebody. 
for saying something that we all say all the time. No, we don't you all can't. say it. And you don't, and you can, we don't all say it. And you well, can't Kyrie assume. Well, Kyrie Irving has said it in the past. And you can't assume that everybody wants to be called that just you, because no. they are black. And that's I'm why I, I feel you, Kyrie like, on this. If, if we all sitting around, I put to you like this. Is the word fuck a bad word? Yes. If we all sitting around and you got a homegirl, she talking. She said something to me. And I say, man, get the fuck out of here. We all sitting around, right? Mm -hmm. If she blows up on me, goes crazy, there's something off. Because no. the, real the reality is, number one, that is a accepted vernacular in most of the places that we... Mm -mm. If so Sam Lindsay was sitting in that circle and you said, get the fuck out of here, he would lose... His mind. Well, that's why, but I'm not inviting Sam Lindsay. That you, to, I'm like, just telling like, you, I'm not, Sam I would Lindsay? But look, look call, but I, call Sam Lindsay uh, Notice I word. said one of your homegirls, though, and I said one of your homegirls because somebody my age, if somebody, if if I'm around one of my elders, it's all different. Okay, it's that's true. It's all different Fair because enough. you never know what the sensibilities of your elders are and you have to make sure... But he's talking to another dude on the basketball court. That's not and, fair to do that to him. Well, no, what I'm saying... It is fair. It is fair. It is definitely fair because we live in the real world. Kyrie, hey, bro, don't call me that. And and he 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 said that, and then he kept it going until he got kicked out of the game. And then he acted as if he acted like Dennis Schroeder was Tyler Hansborough or Tyler Hero or somebody like that. Doesn't matter. He doesn't. He, he, he like, doesn't take the word from anybody. I know, and I, I get and, I, it. and I respect that. That's but how. But you he gotta feels. let people. That's Rachel. Come on, you gotta let come people on, know man. that. What is he supposed to do? Even even if he did tweet, okay, we saw the tweet. He said, "I don't, I don't want to be called that." Nothing like that. That doesn't mean that everybody saw the tweet. So how can he ensure that everybody knows how he feels about the N word? He can't. Well, number one, number one, he he. I mean, he blew up on. I think that if you're talking about your brothers and stuff like that, then you got to give your brothers some grace. Dennis Schroeder is black. That's your brother. He's saying something that you don't like. So rather than blow up at him and try to fight him, hey, man, no N-word for me. I don't really dig it. Blah, 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 blah. And then that's it. The real reason, the real thing is there's something between these guys. He was in his face before Dennis Schroeder said the N-word. And when Dennis Schroeder said the N-word to him, that's when he really lost it. Because Dennis Schroeder said... Damn, nigga. The reason why he said that is because Kyrie Irving was all in his face. Something was going on with Kyrie Irving. How do we at that know point. that? How do we know that that Dennis said that, and then Kyrie was like, "Don't call me that." How we know? And how do we know Dennis didn't keep saying it? I don't, we we don't. But now exactly. we're now we're, we're talking about what we saw. The reality is, look, if you don't be called the N word, you don't be called the N word. But if you come in the barbershop and he's on a basketball court, if you come in the barbershop and you get all ruffled up because people are saying the N words, you got the problem. Did you that, see I'm Kyrie's hair last? Up. Did you see Kyrie's hair? He ain't been in a barbershop. Maybe not. I hope he's okay, though. <laughs> By the way, I love Kyrie's energy, though. Because the reality is that... Too. Do you think that we need to have a conversation about whether or not saying the N-word is appropriate? Do you think we need to do that? Right now? No. I mean, I just Hell think it's, no. just, it's, your, it's your prerogative. You either like it or you don't. And I think... And I do agree with you on that point. Like, right? If I didn't like it... I'd be like, Van, could you please stop using it on the podcast? And you'd probably be like, I don't care what you think. I'm going to say it anyway. Because that's what I say. I liked it. I like it. I don't care. I like it. People, I don't people, care. People say it. Like, people have been saying it to me for a long time. Look, language has etymolo etymology, right? Etymology. Language got, has etymame. I know, I know what you mean. I, I like to get a little language with my sushi. Language got some edamame with it. <laughs> like, like, bring me, bring me some sushi and some language. Some edamame. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, there. The origin of the N word is as putrid as horrible as it gets, and it continues to be that when used in the right way by the right people. But the reality is, language is like anything else that exists on Earth that human beings have uh, usage of. It's a tool. It's a tool. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. means use to express some things, language means one thing, and use to express other things, language means another thing. We don't always like yeah. the way we get tools, but it doesn't mean that we don't have them. But if we all decide we're going to stop saying it, I'm cool. 
But for right now, my nigga, 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 nigga. nigga. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm not that woke. I'm, I'm just not that woke. I'll be honest with you. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, so look, we're not going to do Van's very serious question of the week this week uh, because we have a lot of serious questions that actually need to be answered. Um, this is actually sad. Uh, before we go this week, guys, um... Our producer, Jackson Safan, has to say something. So, Jackson, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Um, thanks, Van. Uh, weird announcement, but my uh, I'm leaving TheRinger.com this week. Uh, I've been working at TheRinger.com for three and a half years, and I've been working on this show for just under a year. 93 episodes. This is the 93rd episode. Um, and so me leaving the ringer means this is uh my last podcast as the producer of Higher Learning with Van Lathan and Rachel Lindsay. And it's um it was something that I wasn't really expecting to have been working on. I wasn't a podcast producer before the show, at least in this this capacity, but it's been one of, if not the most meaningful projects of my both personal and professional life. And I really am thankful for the opportunity, thankful for, to The Ringer for giving me the opportunity, and thankful to you guys, Van and Rach, and Trudy, and Isaiah, and previously Jordan Liggins for letting me do this and giving me the opportunity to work on this show, a show that I know is really meaningful to a lot of people, and especially to be able to be a person of color producing a show uh, hosted by two black people at this time in the country, uh, country's history, really means a lot. And I'm just... I'm just really going to miss it. I really am. I really enjoy the show. I enjoy working with everyone on the team. And it's something that it's, like I said before, it's just been one of the the best things I've ever had the chance to work on. And so I am sad to be leaving, but I will still be listening. I will still be listening. And, you know, when you guys get back in studio in this summer or fall or whatever it is, maybe I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop by and say hi because we're not going to be strangers and I'm still going to be uh, a fan of the pod for as long as it exists. So love you both. Love all the thought warriors. Love Trudy, Isaiah and Jordan. And thank you. Okay. Um, I'm really not going to say too much after that because I, that actually, I'm sad. I'm happy for you, Jackson. I'm uh, proud just the beginning of your career and we definitely will work on some more stuff, but it's, I'm I'm more sad than I thought I would be. (laughs) Uh, Okay. I knew I was going to be sad. No, because I, I mean, listen, we started this thing at a very crucial time in our country. I mean, the, the talks were happening before, but our first podcast was May 2020. Jackson has been here from the beginning. So it's not just about losing someone who's a producer on our show. It's about Helped losing family. Yeah. Exactly. You are a part of the show. You give input. And so it's just a really sad day for the higher learning fam at this point. I know this is going to come a shock of so many thought warriors because people will be asking questions about you all the time, Jackson. But as hard as it is to let you go, you know Van and I always support you in everything that you do. And um, we just wish you the best. You're going to be missed. I actually feel sorry for whoever comes in next because I don't don't know how we're going to be. We don't know. I mean, we don't know the show without you, Jackson. That's just the truth. Well... I appreciate it from both of you, and uh, I'm sure it's still going to be as as good as ever. So you don't need me. It's just you guys doing your thing, you know. But thank you. Thank All you, right. Jackson. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, way to start your Monday there, Thought Warriors. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> it's just been a sad podcast. All, all right. <laughs> the fucking cops on the podcast. And just, the fucking you know. cops. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, you know, no, you know what? Keep the thinking caps on. Keep them on. All right, you'll get to take them off right now. Bye. I'm Van Lathan. I'm Rachel Lindsay. <laughs>